This book is a sequel to book 57. The book that comes in between them is book 114. I find it weird they published the trilogy out of order. You'd think they would publish all three books in a row. That would make sense. Argofunk book review, Argofunk book review. Johnny Saxon is a hard-boiled private eye. He's in Cincinnati, and the first three chapters introduce us to the crimes he'll be solving today. A convict kills a guard and escapes from prison so he can hunt down his old wife. A villain makes it seem like Beth Sherman had an affair so he can blackmail her. The main criminal is a creepy stalker who's following a singer named Jeanette. She tries to leave town when he breaks into her dressing room and manhandles her. He orders her to fulfill her end of the bargain, and he is so determined he doesn't even blink when she pulls a gun on him. Sounds like we've got a lot of creeps running around. What's our hero Johnny Saxon doing? He's checking out women at an auction house. Johnny! An attractive brunette searches desperately through the merchandise until she finds an old, worthless desk. Johnny starts a bidding war to see how she'll react, and she is terrified at the idea of losing. Curious as to why someone is so intent on getting a useless desk, Johnny makes a point of getting her name and address. She's Jeanette Evans, the woman who's being followed by a stalker. She offers to meet with Johnny at 8. When he arrives at her apartment, he finds she was murdered in the bathtub. A quick search of the apartment shows there were secret papers inside the desk. That's why she was desperate to get her hands on it. Jeanette was married to the escaped convict, so he's going to be involved in the mystery. Oh, and she left Johnny's contact information on her desk, so the murderer knows who Johnny is now. Murderer's going to try to kill Johnny multiple times. Johnny has a dopey partner named Mo Martin, who continues to be such a useless character. I don't even know why they keep him in the series. Johnny also has a secretary named Nancy O'Neill. They used to date before Johnny moved to New York. Johnny genuinely loves her, and he's come close to proposing once or twice. He's scared of hurting her, though, because he works in a nasty line of business. I kind of like the relationship between Johnny and Nancy. It was a cute little romance, and I definitely like seeing him treat a woman with respect, as opposed to treating her like garbage and being a sleazebag, which is what he normally does with every single woman he meets. The escaped convict breaks into Johnny's office and accuses Johnny of having an affair with his wife. So here's a good contrast between Johnny's two partners. Nancy knocks the convict unconscious, saving Johnny's life. Way to go, Nancy! Dopey Mo accidentally lets the convict escape. You're useless, Mo. Johnny should make Nancy his main detective partner. Johnny has a reporter friend named Steve Eggers. Steve drinks like crazy. He takes Johnny to a club where they talk with Jeanette's best friend, Irma. Irma tells him all about the creepy stalker. Steve manages to get a photograph of the stalker, but he's too drunk to remember any details. Mo tries sobering Steve up by taking a shower with him, which was a weird scene. The story takes a major turn at this point. It almost feels like a totally different mystery. Johnny and Nancy leave Cincinnati for an exclusive ski resort called The Colony. They're going undercover as husband and wife to determine which of the guests is trying to blackmail Nancy's sister. Johnny feels awkward pretending to be married to Nancy. Nancy is scandalized to learn their room only has one bed. She orders Johnny to sleep on the couch. There are seven other guests at the resort. We have the two victims. Uh, Sam Clark is a retired doctor. Doris Wells is much older than her husband. B. Cronk is an angry, unmarried woman. Ralph Cronk is the creepy stalker. Johnny recognizes him right away. Doris gets into a fight with Ralph and goes running to Dr. Clark for comfort. Johnny wonders why she's so involved with men who are not her husband. The group goes to a club. Johnny tries to get Doris to talk by drinking large amounts of alcohol with her. Just when she's about to spill the beans on Ralph, Dr. Clark interrupts. Johnny goes backstage and talks to Irma, who confirms Ralph is the culprit. 
Ralph turns off the lights and shoots at them twice. Luckily, Johnny and Irma avoid death by falling to the floor. The fact that Johnny is half drunk helps him a lot when it comes to falling down. Now that the culprit's onto him, Johnny is terrified for Nancy's life. She is in real danger. He's got to save her. He rushes back to the resort, even though he's clearly not in any condition to drive. He talks with Ralph's sister on the way. She pulls a gun on him, but he's able to disarm her. She confesses Ralph plans to use hidden letters from the desk in order to blackmail Doris over a previous marriage. By the time they get back to the resort, Ralph has been murdered. Johnny solves this murder pretty easily. Dr. Sam is Doris's adopted father. They killed Ralph in order to get the blackmail material. With the case closed, Johnny goes back to his room. He pretends to be drunk so he can kiss Nancy. She likes kissing him, but she's not fooled by his acting. The escaped convict arrives at the resort, but he is shot and killed by the police. Mo called the police there, so Mo is not completely useless. Although the cops are already on their way to the resort, so let's not throw him a parade or anything. The end. Post book follow up. Since this is the end of the trilogy, let's make up a happy ending for Johnny Saxon. He quits his job as a detective and goes back to being an author. He is way more successful as an author, let's be honest. He marries Nancy and lives happily ever after. This book was okay. I feel like it was longer than it needed to be. If the storyline at the ski resort hadn't happened, then the book would have been much shorter. I like the stuff with the creepy convict, who is easily more frightening and interesting than the real culprit. It's sad that he was mostly an irrelevant red herring. His only connection to the main story is that his former wife was killed. At the end, the book says he proposed to two of the other female characters, but that doesn't quite justify his involvement. I like the idea of important blackmail evidence hidden in a desk at an auction. It's never explained why the culprit forced the victim to get the desk instead of getting it himself. It's also a bit weird that he went through so much trouble to get evidence for blackmail purposes. Remember, he blackmails Nancy's sister without any evidence, he just makes something up. I'm fairly certain the culprit's MO changed in that case because the author didn't want Nancy's sister to be involved in a legitimately bad activity because that would make Nancy guilty by association. Overall, the book was decent enough. In some ways, it was a stronger mystery than the first book, certainly a more traditional mystery, with the group of six suspects at a resort together. But for whatever reason, this book did not entertain me as much as the first one did. I give Harlequin number 68, The Queen City Murder Case, a 7 out of 10.